I can take you through it. Step by step, explaining why your story stinks. But I won't insult your intelligence. Well, all right. First of all... Really? Worst film you ever saw? Well, my next one will be better. Hello? I hated this movie. Hated, 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 hated this movie. Hated it. Hated every simpering, stupid, vacant, audience-insulting moment of it. So there's an old line from Mark Twain where he says that everybody complains about the weather, but no one ever does anything about it. And that's kind of how I feel about screenplays. Hey everybody, my name's Michael Arn. I'm a screenwriter. I wrote Little Miss Sunshine and a couple of other movies. And I put this video together because when I first started out trying to write screenplays, I just didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I kind of stumbled around in the dark for years and years and I just made every possible mistake you could make as a screenwriter. So I wanted to make this video and just put as much as I know about storytelling into it. And my hope is that if you love movies and you're just starting out trying to write screenplays, maybe some of these ideas will be helpful. Now, I just want to say a, quickly a disclaimer because I know that I'm going to get roasted alive by people who are saying, oh, he's trying to turn story into a formula and he's trying to say that stories can only be one thing. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm going to say this three times, which is I'm not saying this is the only way to tell stories. I'm not saying this is the only way to tell stories. I'm not saying this is the only way to tell stories. You can tell a story any way you want. There's any kind of way of telling stories. What I'm doing here with this video is I'm taking three movies, Star Wars, The Graduate, and Little Miss Sunshine, and I'm just analyzing how they work. I'm just trying to show what the narrative mechanics are going on underneath them. So I'm describing how they work, okay? I'm not prescribing. I'm not saying that stories have to be like this. I'm only saying, here's three films. Here's how they work. So again, the disclaimer is, I'm not saying that films have to work this way or stories have to work this way. Stories can work any way you want. You can write any kind of ending you want. This is just one specific kind of ending that I used in my own film, Little Miss Sunshine. So just a quick backstory, which is when I got out of film school, I wanted to be a screenwriter and I got a job reading screenplays. And so I read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of screenplays. And what I found was that a lot of them could set up very well. And usually your first act was sort of entertaining and sort of engaging. And a lot of scripts could get to the second act and, and were still working. But most of the time, scripts tended to fail in the third act. And I kind of saw over and over again, I saw stories sort of just fall apart at the end. Either they felt sort of mechanical and predictable, or a lot of times, even if the ending worked, there was this sort of so what factor. You like, okay, the hero got the pretty girl and he got the bag of money, but like, so what? Who cares, you know? Or the girl, she got the handsome guy and she got the dream job, so what? And so I was trying to write screenplays and I was just obsessed with endings and going like, why do these endings not work? And I was trying to like figure out how to make endings really work. So when I was just starting out, I remember reading a book that said that in order to analyze a story, what you had to do was you had to break down the stakes in the story. And it said there was two sets of stakes. There was the external stakes, what was going to be gained or lost in the outside world. And then there was an internal set of stakes. There was sort of an emotional set of stakes. And so that was my guide for a long, long time. But I finally decided that there was one additional set of stakes that people weren't really paying attention to or people really weren't talking about, which was a philosophical set of stakes in a story. And kind of at the same time, I got obsessed with the ending of Star Wars. Like, the ending of Star Wars is so crazy and weird and mysterious. Like, Luke is sitting there, he's in his little X-Wing fighter, and he's trying to blow up the Death Star, and sort of out of nowhere, all of a sudden, like, Obi-Wan Kenobi's voice sort of comes back and starts talking to him, and he pushes aside his computer targeting screen, and it's this really weird thing. Like, I, I remember going, like, why? what is Obi-Wan doing there in Luke's cockpit, like, when he's trying to, you know, fucking defeat the Empire? So I finally just sat down, and I mapped out what was going on at the ending of Star Wars, and it gave me all these ideas about sort of your external stakes, your internal stakes, and your philosophical stakes. And that was very helpful to me in terms of writing out Little Miss Sunshine and especially sort of engineering the ending of that movie. And again, I'm just gonna say that I'm gonna resist the notion that I'm just applying a one-size-fits-all formula to storytelling, okay? That's not what I'm doing. Again, stories can be anything you want. All I'm really trying to do with this video is to give people a vocabulary to talk about stories and storytelling, to give people tools. They had this saying at Pixar, it's tools, not rules. You know, this is not a set of rules. This is not even a set of guidelines. This is just, again, trying to put out a vocabulary in which people can think about, talk about, and, and, and hopefully write out great stories. So here's a lecture. It's called Endings, the Good, the Bad, and the Insanely Great. 
The cliche is that movies are all about the last 10 minutes, but the argument that I'm going to make is really that movies are all about the climactic two minutes of the movie. And that's because the climactic two minutes are the place where the meaning of your movie is revealed. When you're talking about meaning, you're talking about the values that are embedded in your story. So when you're talking about values, you're talking about guides to life, how you live your life, what you think is worth living for, what you think is worth doing, what you think is not worth doing. So in a weird way, stories are really sort of guides to how you live your life. If stories are about competing values, then they're about competing visions of how you should really live your life. And I think we've all had the experience of uh, going to see a movie and just going like walking out of it, walking out of the ending and go, oh my God, the ending was so great. You know, and you have this sense of euphoria and release and the sense of clarity and you're feel like you're looking at the world with new eyes and you actually think that, you know, when you walked in, you thought life was pretty terrible, but actually it seems that like right now, it seems that life is actually pretty great. So I think we all have our, you know, personal list of uh, movies that we love, especially the endings that we love. The endings I really love are Fellini's Eight and a Half, Star Wars, also Catch-22, The Graduate, and of course, The Bad News Bears. Hey, Yankees, you can take your apology out of your trophy and shove it straight up your ass. So we all know what a bad ending is, right? A bad ending is, we've seen them a gazillion times, it's one that's positive, but it's predictable. You knew it was going to happen, and it happened. And a good ending is one that's positive, but it's surprising. You, you wanted something to happen, but you weren't sure how it was going to happen. But then, boom, it turned out, and, and you're super happy, you know, that, that it turned out as well as it did. Now, for an insanely great ending, I think the thing is that you want it to be both surprising and positive, but the most important thing is that you want your ending to be meaningful. And I think that that's the thing that a lot of stories fall down on. They don't have the ending be as meaningful as they could be. This is the thing that's going to set your ending apart from every other ending out there is that it's not just going to be positive. It's not just going to be surprising. It's going to be super meaningful to your audience. So the question is, how do you put meaning into your story? How do you make your story meaningful to the people who are sitting there watching it? So when you're talking about meaning, you're talking about the values that are embedded in your story. And usually in a story, you don't just have one set of values. You have two sets of values. You could call them values A or values B. But the way I prefer to think of it is a lot of times you have a dominant set of values in your story, these sort of pervasive, ubiquitous values in your story, and then you have an underdog set of values, which is sort of a scrappy band of misfits set of values. And what you want to do is you want to have the dominant values of your story on the verge of defeating those underdog values. You want a sudden reversal to happen and then have the underdog values prevail over the dominant values of your story. And that sudden reversal is overturning the moral order of the universe that you've created in your story. And that sudden reversal of values becomes the meaning of your story. This is something Robert McKee says. I don't agree with him on everything, but he says something really smart, which is the more meaning that you can put into your story, the more emotional it will be. And I really, really believe that, especially for the ending. So the more meaningful emotion you can have there at the end of your story, the more insanely great it's going to be. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Star Wars, and I want to show the final climactic two minutes. What's important to remember is that when this movie came out, you know, we look back on it now, it's almost a 40-year-old movie, and it seems like it's very predictable, like it seems almost quaint in certain ways. But boy, when this movie came out, the ending worked so well. People went berserk for this ending. There was a contemporary reports at the time of they were saying, like, when Han Solo came in, like, bodies were flying through the theater at the premiere because people just went so crazy for this ending. So however quaint it may look to us now, you have to admit that this is an ending that worked. It worked for the audience at the time, and I will argue I think it still works. So here we go. I'm going to play the climactic two minutes of Star Wars, and then I'm going to go back, sort of open up the hood, dig down, and see what the mechanics underneath the hood of this ending are. So here's the climactic two minutes of Star Wars. Use the Force, Luke. Let go, Luke. The Force is strong in this one. Luke, trust me. Switched off your targeting computer. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm all right. I've lost our two. Rebel base in range. You may fire when ready. Command is primary ignition.
remember, the Force will be with you always. Okay, so the question is, how does it work? What is going on at the ending of this movie? And in order to figure out what's going on almost in any story, you know, a lot of times you get a screenplay and it's this sort of big salad, it's this big spaghetti bowl of character and plot and incident, and you're trying to figure out what's working in this story, what's not working. And I always feel like the most important thing to do to go back to figure out how to make a story work is to ask the question, what is at stake in a story? So we all know what stakes are. Stakes are like what can be gained or lost. And the important thing is it has to be a binary thing. It has to be a pass-fail thing. It has to be black and white. You're either going to gain something or you're going to lose something when you're talking about the stakes of a story. So the main argument that I'm going to make is that usually in a good story, you don't just have one set of stakes. Usually, to my eyes, you have three sets of stakes in your story. If you don't remember anything else from this video, try to remember this, that every good story should have three sets of stakes in it. In terms of external stakes, like we're all familiar with this, your external stakes are usually something like life and survival, or it, you're trying to get the bag of money, you're robbing the bank and trying to get the money. Sometimes it's winning a contest, uh, sometimes it's achieving any kind of like sort of position or status, any sort of achievable goal, any sort of pass-fail thing, anything that's sort of out there in the outside world, those are the external stakes of your story. Now, for the internal stakes of your story, the emotional stakes of your story, a lot of times it's romantic love. You fall in love with, love with someone, you're hoping that they're going to reciprocate their love. Or a lot of times it's a, a parent-child love. You know, in Finding Nemo, for example, you know, Marlon loses the love of Nemo and he's trying to win his child's love and respect back. Sometimes in movies, like, it can be friendship. You know, a friendship can be, can be gained or lost, and that's what you put emotionally at stake. And a lot of times it's self-respect. I mean, it's really interesting that, uh, for example, in the first Rocky film, he's sort of out there training, but he considers himself kind of a bum in the neighborhood. He's training, but he's smoking cigarettes, and he doesn't really even respect himself. And just the act, he doesn't win the championship, right? But he goes 15 rounds with Apollo Creed, and in doing so, he gains his own self-respect. So the philosophical stakes of your story. A lot of times in movies, what's at stake philosophically is you're privileging the values of community over the individual. And you see this in films like Casablanca or Star Wars, where the hero chooses the values of community over the values of narrow self-interest. Conversely, a lot of times in movies, you are having, for example, in Catch-22 or The Graduate, you're privileging the values of individualism over the stifling conformity of the community. And then for something like Little Miss Sunshine, I always thought just the philosophical stakes were, do you live your life trying to be an ideal? Do you live your life trying to be like Barbie, you know, to win a beauty contest? Or do you live your life trying to be yourself? So three sets of stakes, external, internal, and philosophical. And what I'm going to argue is that most movies, right, have an external set of stakes. Every movie, James Bond, you're trying to save the world or you're trying to rob a bank, or you're trying to win the heavyweight championship of the world. You're just trying to do something. So almost every movie has an external set of stakes. Most movies have an internal set of stakes. There's something emotional going on. The place where a lot of films fall down or a lot of films get muddy or a lot of films become suboptimal is in the philosophical stakes of the story. A lot of stories are not as clear or articulate as they could be in terms of what the underlying set of values in their stories are and creating a drama out of two competing value systems that are embedded in those stories. Okay, so before we go any further, I just want to take a giant step backwards and look at the big picture of storytelling. So let's say you have a 100-minute movie, and uh, that translates into a 100-page screenplay. And so uh, we're all familiar with the general outlines of a story arc, right? So you start off your movie and you have your exposition, and that's the moment in which you're establishing the stakes of your story. You're establishing what's going to be gained or lost. But the important thing is you're establishing not just what's externally at stake in your story. You're also establishing the internal stakes of your story, the emotional stakes your story, and you're also establishing what's philosophically at stake in your story, what's going to be gained or lost philosophically. And then as you move through the second act of your story, you're going to add complications to your story. You're going to put those stakes into jeopardy, external, internal, and philosophical. So then you get to a crisis where you're forcing the stakes of your story, you get to your climax, and then you get to your resolution in which you're resolving the stakes of your story external, internal, and philosophical, all at, hopefully at the same time. So I'm going to make the argument that there's actually an organic logic to storytelling. There's an organic logic to narrative. And it goes back to the vocabulary that we're all familiar with in terms of fairy tales, you know, once upon a time or lived happily ever after. So with a typical fairy tale, you know, you begin your movie once upon a time and you get the who, what, where, when of your story. And you also have what you're doing is you're saying, and then every day you're establishing the daily routine of your hero, plus usually you're introducing some kind of unresolved issue. It's either an internal unresolved issue inside them, or it's an external unresolved issue. It's some problem that there is with the world. So you're going once upon a time, your hero's walking down the road of life. It's a bright, sunny day. You know, there's a few clouds on the horizon. And then you go, but then one day, ba-boom, something comes along and it totally disrupts your hero's life. It turns your hero's life upside down and it changes their sense of who they are. It changes their sense of what the world is like. And it also changes their sense of the future. And in the wake of that bolt from the blue, your hero embarks upon a quest. 
And usually what you're doing is that they have a long range goal they're trying to achieve and then they have a short term plan to achieve that goal. So for example, with Dorothy, you know, she wants to get home to Kansas and to get home to Kansas, she got to go see the wizard. To see the wizard, she's got to follow the yellow brick roads. So then you get to usually a moment in which suddenly without warning, something happens, you know, that pulls the rug out from under your character and they have a, a setback at the middle of their story and they have to sort of take stock, look inside themselves and figure out a new way forward. And then there's always a moment in a story, in a fairy tale, where you go, and then there was no going back. You know, you have to enter the dragon's cave, you have to slay the dragon or whatever, but there's no going back. You can't go back to safety anymore. And then you have your climax where your hero either achieves his goal or fails to achieve his goal. But for example, once upon a time, there was a prince who lived in a castle in Denmark, and every day he mourned the untimely death of his father, the king, and the sudden remarriage of his mother, the queen, to his sleazy uncle, the king's brother. And then you say, and then one day, the ghost of the dead king appeared to the prince and claimed he was murdered by his brother and demanded that the prince avenge his untimely death. So your hero dithers and dithers, and then you go, then the hero embarked upon a quest. And the hero's quest was to find out if his uncle was guilty by staging a play, reenacting the murder, and then, if his uncle was guilty, to avenge his father's death by killing his sleazy uncle. However, suddenly and without warning, the prince, having discovered his uncle was guilty, accidentally kills the wrong guy and gets sent into exile by his uncle. And then the prince returns, he gets challenged to a duel, and there was no going back, and then you have a climax where everybody gets killed. So that's the story of Hamlet, right? And you can say, you know, Shakespeare is a hack and he was just following a formula, but my argument would be that he was actually following the organic logic of a story, the once upon a time, the then one day, you know, the hero embarking upon a quest. And so in script speak, we talk about the once upon a time moments there's a different word for them. The once upon a time is the opening of your story. The and then one day moment is the inciting incident of your story. When your hero embarks upon a quest, that's the first act break of your story. Suddenly without warning, that's the midpoint of your story. And then there was no going back. That's the second act break of your story. And then of course, ba-boom, there's your climax at the end of your story. And these moments of your story tend to correspond with a certain page number. So for example, page one is your opening, of course. Around page 10, you have your inciting incident. Page 25 is your first act break. 50 is your midpoint. 75 is your second act break. And your climax, of course, comes 10 minutes from the end uh, on page 90. And I would call these the tentpole moments of storytelling. A lot of times people ask me to read their screenplays, and I feel like if you can just tell me what these six moments are, if you can tell me what the six tentpole moments of your story are, I can tell you whether or not you've got a good story or not. So when I'm working on a story, I like to think of these moments in visual terms. So with the opening, I always imagine it as sort of tanking up. You're just getting as much emotional rocket fuel as you can right at the beginning of your story. And then when the inciting incident comes along, that's sort of lighting a fuse. You just, the status quo of your story is shattered and a fuse is lit, you know, that's heading towards that emotional rocket fuel. You get to your first act break and ba-boom, that's the blast off. You have sort of maximum rooting interest in your story. You want to see your hero sort of take off and, and either externally or internally go on this quest and achieve a goal. Then, in terms of the midpoint, the image I always have in my head is that the rug is getting pulled up from under your hero. You know, he's headed towards his goal, he's got his eye on it, and suddenly, whoa, the, uh, the rug gets pulled out from under him, and he sort of, like, has to pick himself up, dust himself off, and find a new way towards that goal. With the second act break, I know this is kind of complicated, but the image I have in my head is that your, your hero is headed towards his goal, it seems like it's almost within his grasp, and then suddenly a trap door opens, and your hero falls down, and suddenly he's in a canoe, sort of headed down a river towards a waterfall, and he is either gonna like get to safety, get to the edge of the river and save himself, or he's gonna go over the waterfall and get himself killed. But you fall through a trap door, and you get into a do or die, all or nothing situation. Here's your story, three acts. Usually on page one, you're opening up on a world that's sort of in equilibrium. You know, there might be a few flaws in it, there might be a few problems, but basically the world is steady and equilibrium. Then you meet your hero, and a lot of times your hero is flawed or the world itself is flawed, but your hero has a stable sense of himself, he has a stable sense of what the world is, and he has a fixed sense of what his future is gonna be. Usually you, you wanna have your hero have a very clear visual sense of what their future is gonna be. And then on page 10, ba-boom, you have your bolt from the blue, and your hero's future changes, it changes his sense of himself, it also changes his sense of the world. A lot of times it's the worst possible thing for the hero. Like whatever is most valuable for the hero, that's the thing that gets taken away from them sort of in the inciting incident. And a lot of times you're adding an insult to injury moment in order to put in more emotional rocket fuel into your story. And what you're doing in the inciting incident is you're creating a global problem in your story. You're creating a problem that your hero has to solve. And that's the problem that's gonna get solved at the climax of your story on page 90. So with Little Miss Sunshine, for example, you know, on page 10, Aunt Cindy calls and, you know, ba-boom, Olive has, you know, a place in a Little Miss Sunshine contest. Big contest in Redondo Beach. You know, and she's so excited and 
and she can't wait. And that's tying into the climax of your story is, you know, the question is, is she going to win the Little Miss Sunshine contest or not? So then in the wake of the inciting incident, a lot of times your hero doesn't know what to do. You know, they're sort of casting around. They're trying to figure out what to do. And they find a course of action and they seize upon that. And then you get to your first act break. You've lit the fuse. It's connected with your emotional rocket fuel and you're taking off into your second act. And so your second act, you're creating a smaller goal. You're creating a local goal, you know, that's going to lead to a solution to the global goal. So, for example, in Little Miss Sunshine, Olive wants to win the Little Miss Sunshine pageant, but first they've got to get to Redondo Beach in California. Or, for example, in Star Wars, Luke wants to save the Rebellion, but in order to do that, he's got to take R2-D2 and deliver the plans inside R2 to Princess Leia's father on Alderaan. So, ba-boom, your second act begins with your hero having a goal and embarking on a quest. And so your hero is going through the story and he gets to the midpoint and suddenly usually there's a setback or some kind of reversal or your story changes directions. And a lot of time what you're doing is deepening the stakes of your story and you're revealing stuff that had pre previously been hidden in the story. A lot of times what you're doing also is you're having to force your character to look within and see a flaw inside themselves that they had been blind to uh, before that time. Okay, so here's your third act. You get to page 75, and your hero is achieving their second act goal, but sort of inadvertently forcing the stakes for your global goal. And then what happens from your second act break to your climax, usually it's just nothing but things going wrong for your hero. You have external setbacks, you have internal or emotional setbacks, but you also have philosophical setbacks for your story. And a lot of times I call this the Judas moment of betrayal, which is your hero's closest ally. The person that your hero feels like he can count on the most is the person that betrays them philosophically and chooses the dominant values of the story. So that's, again, the sort of Judas moment of the story. We'll get into a few examples of that. So then you get to page 89, and I like to call this moment the kamikaze moment of commitment because a lot of times your hero is headed into the sort of killer be killed moment with their bad guy or whoever, and the voice, at that moment, the voice of the mentor comes back to them, and it's something that only the hero can hear. And he's sort of whispering into the hero's ear and saying, remember those underdog values that we talked about back in the first act? You know, live your life according to those values. And so the hero chooses the underdog values, usually against their own self-interest, and you want everyone else in the movie to go, oh my God, what are you doing? That's crazy. And then you get to a moment of despair in which it seems as though your hero has failed externally, failed internally, failed philosophically, and if you stop the movie at that moment, it seems like there's no positive outcome possible. So then you get to your decisive act, and your decisive act is positive, right? It's surprising, and it's meaningful. And it's meaningful because, and this is crucial, the decisive act speaks to and is an embodiment of the underdog values of your story. So your hero doesn't have to get up at the climax of your story and give a big speech, right? That's just bad writing. The underdog values are embedded in the decisive act itself. And that's the thing that, again, is going to turbocharge the emotion at the end of your story and give your story an insanely great ending. Okay, so how do all these ideas work in an actual movie, right? Let's take a look at Star Wars. Okay, so Star Wars. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the movie and try and explain what's at stake externally, what's at stake internally, and what's at stake philosophically. Okay, so external stakes. So you're introducing the external stakes of your story in the inciting instant of the story, and you're introducing sort of the global problem that Luke is going to have to try and solve at the climax of the story. So here's the scene in Star Wars that introduces the external stakes of the story. I have placed information vital to the survival of the Rebellion into the memory systems of this R2 unit. My father will know how to retrieve it. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. So it's the survival of the Rebellion. That's what's externally at stake in Star Wars. The Rebellion is either going to prosper and survive, or it's going to be wiped out completely. Now, a lot of times what you do in your story, when you're trying to introduce the philosophical stakes to your story, is that you have the bad guy, your antagonist, come in, and he sort of says to the hero, kid, let me tell you the way the world works. And he lays out the dominant set of values for this whole universe. And I like to call this the antagonist aria. So here's the antagonist aria of Star Wars that happens right at the end of uh, Act One. It's Peter Cushing telling you how the world works in Star Wars. The Rebellion will continue to gain a support in the Imperial Senate. The, the Imperial as long Senate will no longer be of any concern to us. I have just received word that the Emperor has dissolved the Council permanently. The last remnants of the Old Republic have been swept away. Well, it's impossible. How will the Emperor maintain control without the bureaucracy? The regional governors now have direct control over their territories. Fear will keep the local systems in line. Fear of this battle station.
So fear. Peter Cushing is saying, we are going to rule through fear, through coercion, we're an empire. And then you have the underdog values of the story. And a lot of times what you're doing is just like you have the bad guy, the antagonist come in and say, here's the way I think the world works. The hero also meets a mentor, and the mentor is the one who speaks to the underdog values of the story. And the mentor will give a speech to say, kid, you know, I know everybody else thinks this, but really things are like this. So here is the mentor's speech in Star Wars. You must learn the ways of the Force if you're to come with me to Alderaan. Alderaan? I'm not going to Alderaan. I've got to get home. It's late. I'm in for it as it is. I need your help, Luke. She needs your help. I'm getting too old for this sort of thing. I can't get involved. I've got work to do. It's not that I like the Empire. I hate it, but there's nothing I can do about it right now. It's all such a long way from here. That's your uncle talking. So Obi-Wan is saying, I need your help, she needs your help. He's saying that the way we should get along in the world is not through empire, is not through domination, is not through fear, but it's through democracy, through cooperation, through helping each other. So we all get this, right? It's the empire versus republic. It's fear versus the consent of the governed. It's violence versus cooperation. It's tyranny versus freedom. It's basically good guys versus bad guys. And that's all set up in the first act of the story. Now, what you're also doing is you're not just establishing what's philosophically at stake in the global world, but you're also establishing what's philosophically at stake in the personal realm. So here is a speech in Star Wars in which Alec Guinness, playing Obi-Wan, talks to Luke about what the underdog values of the story are personally. The Force? Now, the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. What Obi-Wan is saying here is that we are all connected to each other. We're all united. You know, the Force is something that all unites us all. So here's the philosophical antagonist of Star Wars telling Luke the way the world works through his eyes. <laughs> Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. You don't believe in the Force, do you? Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful Force controlling everything. There's no mystical energy field that controls my destiny. It's all a lot of simple tricks and nonsense. So what Han is saying here is there is no force. There is no commonality. We're not connected to each other. We're all alone in this universe. So in the drama of the philosophical stakes of your story, you're setting up the dominant values at the beginning in Act 1 with the antagonist Arya, in which he says to your hero, like, here's the way the world works. And then what happens usually in Act 3 is you have your hero's closest ally come to him and philosophically betray your hero. Again, what I call the Judas moment of betrayal because the hero's ally is going to choose the dominant values of the universe and reject the underdog values of the universe. And then for the underdog values, you have your mentor give a speech in act one and say, kid, there's another way to see the world. There's another way of living your life. And then you get to act three and you'll have the mentor return. The mentor is gonna come back and whisper in the ear of your hero and remind him of the underdog values that they talked about in the first act of the story. Use the force, Luke. Let go, The Force is strong in this one. Luke, trust me. His computer's on. Luke, you switched off your targeting computer. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm all right. So what's philosophically at stake in Star Wars is this notion of, are we connected to each other? You know, do we share this sort of universal kinship, or are we all just disconnected and it's every man for himself? And that bleeds out to a larger set of values, right? Do we choose to live our lives according to the ideas, the tenets of altruism and community and selflessness, or do we pursue a path of sort of self-interest, individualism, and selfishness? So here's the philosophical stakes of Star Wars, right? On the global level, it's all about empire and dominance versus democracy and cooperation. On a personal level, it's sort of about greed and selfishness versus duty and altruism. Now let's go to the internal stakes of Star Wars, what's emotionally at stake at Star Wars. With Star Wars, it was a little trickier, and I had to go back and watch the film a couple of times because I was thinking, well, is it a romance with Princess Leia? But obviously, that's not really going to be it. And then I was also thinking, well, maybe, you know, uh, Luke is trying to find a father figure in Obi-Wan. Maybe that's what he's searching for. But then, you know, Obi-Wan gets killed sort of at the end of the second act. And so I couldn't figure out sort of what the emotional stakes 
of Star Wars were. And I had to go back and watch the movie a couple of times. And I finally found a moment where I felt like it sort of like brought everything to a head. So here is the scene in which you're setting up what's internally, what's emotionally at stake in Star Wars. Your only concern is to prepare those new droids for tomorrow. In the morning, I want them up there on the South Ridge working on those condensers. I think those new droids are going to work out fine. In fact, I, uh, also thinking about our agreement, about me staying on another season. And if these new droids do work out, I want to transmit my application to the Academy this year. You mean the next semester before the harvest? Sure, there's more than enough droids. Harvest is when I need you the most. Only one season more. This year we'll make enough on the harvest that I'll be able to hire some more hands, and then you can go to the Academy next year. You must understand, I need you here, Luke. But it's a whole nother year. Look, it's only one more season. Yeah, that's what she said when Biggs and Tank left. Where are you going? Looks like I'm going nowhere. I have to go finish cleaning those droids. Oh, and he can't stay here forever. Most of his friends have gone. It means so much to him. I'll make it up to him next year. I promise. <laughs> Luke's just not a farmer, Owen. He has too much of his father in him. That's what I'm afraid of. kind of expect him to start singing over the rainbow at that moment, you know, looking at those two sons. But the argument I'm going to make here is that what's emotionally at stake in Star Wars is Luke's sense of being called to a greater destiny. It's the call to greatness. And this is something I think we can all relate to, right? Because we've all felt that way, right? We've all felt like we we're just like a, a small town kid in a small town world, and somewhere out there, there's something bigger, more exciting happening. There's like a greater destiny out there. And the drama of our lives is like, are we going to be able to go out there and reach it? Are we going to be able to go out and fulfill it? Like, are we even going to get a chance to go out there and see the world and have adventures and, and fulfill our, our, our full potential? So just as you have a, an antagonist and a mentor in your external stakes, you also have an antagonist and a mentor in your internal set of stakes. So the bad guy emotionally in Star Wars is actually Uncle Owen. He's the guy who's looking at Luke and saying, hey, don't get too big for bridges, kid. You're just a small town kid in a small town world. Your only job is to make sure those condensers are working tomorrow. Don't get any big dreams. You're not that special. And then the opposite of that is Obi-Wan, and he's the guy, the mentor, who looks at you and says, kid, I see something special in you. I think you have the seeds of greatness inside you. Okay, so three sets of stakes in Star Wars. Externally, it's the survival of the rebellion. Internally, it's Luke's call to greatness. And philosophically, it's this question of do you live your life according to the values of selfishness or according to the values of altruism? And in each set of stakes, you have a bad guy, right? So externally, it's Darth Vader who's trying to crush the rebellion. Internally, it's Uncle Owen who's saying, kid, you're not that special. And philosophically, it's going to be Han Solo saying, hey, it's smarter to be selfish and self-interested than to help anybody. And what I'm going to do next is just talk about how each set of stakes has its own story arc to it. It has its own inciting incident, its own first act break, etc. So here's the arc of the external stakes in Star Wars, which is you begin on page one, and on page 10, you have your inciting incident. You're establishing that the survival of the rebellion is at stake. On page 25, you're giving... Luke a goal, which is to deliver the plans that are inside R2-D2, right, to Princess Leia's father on Alderaan. Now, if you're a bad screenwriter, that would be the second act for the rest of your story, just watching Luke try to get R2-D2 to Alderaan. But Lucas does something super, super smart here in terms of storytelling, which is he has a Death Star show up and just blow up Alderaan, right? So now you know that Luke and Obi-Wan are heading towards a planet that doesn't exist anymore. So that's a great little thing to happen at the beginning of your second act, right? Your hero has a plan, they're heading towards that plan, and then something comes along and disrupts that plan. So you get to page 50, and, you know, they come out of hyperspace, and, oh, my God, Alderaan's gone, and there's a tractor beam, and they get sucked into the Death Star. So that's sort of this midpoint reversal of the story. But then as soon as you get into the Death Star, right, you have a new goal. You go, oh, my God, she's here, she's here, we've got to go rescue the princess. So you're spending the third quarter of the film going out, finding the princess, and rescuing her. 
And then you get to the second act, and you rescue the princess, you escape from the Death Star, and it seems like you've achieved your goals, right? You've taken R2-D2, you don't go to Alderaan, but you find Princess Leia's father, and you deliver the plan. And so it seems as though you've achieved your second act goal. However, this is a genius thing. So at the same time you're delivering the plans to the Death Star to Princess Leia's father and the rebels, you're inadvertently revealing the location of the rebels' base, and that's forcing the stakes of your story, right? Because now the Death Star is on its way. Now the Death Star is coming. So now either the Death Star is going to survive or the rebels are going to survive but they both can't survive at the same time. You get to your climax, you blow up the Death Star, you save the Rebellion, and you have your ending. Now you have a similar arc in the internal story of Star Wars, the emotional story. It begins on page one, and you already have Luke planning to leave the farm, go off, join the Space Academy. So the inciting incident is actually when he sits down with his aunt and uncle and asks to go to Space Academy, and he gets turned down. And now his future has changed, and he feels diminished somehow. He feels like he's maybe not that special. However, just a few pages later, right, he meets Obi-Wan, and Obi-Wan leaves and goes, you must learn the ways of the Force. And Obi-Wan is saying, like, I believe in you, kid. I think you got something special inside you. So when you get to page 25, right, the end of the first act, Uncle Owen gets killed, and now Luke is free to leave home and pursue his greater destiny. I want to come with you to Alderaan. There's nothing for me here now. I want to learn the ways of the Force and become a Jedi like my father. You get to your midpoint, and Obi-Wan is training Luke to use the Force, right? And when Luke is actually able to connect and use the Force, he dodges that, that droid. And Obi-Wan turns to him and says, you've taken your first step into a much larger world. And what that's doing is affirming Luke's sense that maybe he is special. Maybe he does have something inside him. Like, maybe he is destined for greatness somehow. So then on page 75, at the end of the second act, you have this enormous setback in the emotional stakes of your story because Obi-Wan gets killed by Darth Vader and you suddenly think, oh my God, maybe Uncle Owen was right. Maybe Obi-Wan was just a crazy old man. And then you get to your climax on page 90 and that's when Obi-Wan returns and he whispers in Luke's ear and he says, remember, trust your feelings, use the Force. So Luke is able to blow up the Death Star and Obi-Wan comes back and says, remember, the Force will be with you always. And that's the resolution of the emotional stakes of Star Wars. So there's a similar arc in the philosophical stakes of the story. You meet Luke on page one, and he's sort of sympathetic to the rebellion, but he's not doing anything about it. He's sitting around, and he says, it's not like I'd like the Empire. I hate it, but there's nothing I can do. And Uncle Owen is the guy who's sort of stoking that at the same time. He's saying, your only job is to prepare those new droids for tomorrow morning. The inciting incident, then, philosophically, is meeting Obi-Wan and having Obi-Wan say, I need your help. She needs your help. And Obi-Wan is introducing this new set of possibilities that you can live your life according to the values of altruism. So on page 25, Uncle Owen dies, and now Luke sets off. He says, I'm committed to this underdog set of values. I'm committed to helping Obi-Wan and trying to help Princess Leia. Now you get to the midpoint, and you meet Han Solo, and he's the philosophical antagonist of the story. He's the guy who says, I don't believe in the Force. I don't believe in any sort of universal connection. And he also says, I take orders from one guy, me. So you're meeting a guy who doesn't believe in the values that Obi-Wan has been preaching to Luke. You meet a guy who's sort of disdainful of those values and saying, listen, kid, that's not the way the world works at all. So now you get to page 75, and again, you have this huge setback at the end of the second act. Obi-Wan dies, and then a few pages later, Han Solo flees the rebel base, and that's the Judas moment of betrayal. That's the moment in which your hero's closest ally sort of turns his back on the hero, turns his back on the good values of the story, the underdog values, and chooses to embrace the dominant values of the story. And then you have the climax of the story in which the mentor comes back and he sort of whispers in the hero's ear and he says, remember those good values that we talked about? Remember our sense of connectedness? Remember helping people? Like you've got to commit to those values. And then you have a moment a few minutes later where Han Solo comes back, right? And he embraces the values of teamwork. He embraces the values of duty and sacrifice and he shoots Darth Vader off Luke's tail. And it's a combination of those two things. It's a combination of Luke remembering what Obi-Wan said and Han Solo coming back embracing the uh, values of altruism that allows Luke to finally shoot the bullseye and blow up the Death Star. And then you have your ending where the good values have prevailed over the bad values. The underdog values have prevailed over the dominant values. Democracy, freedom, connection, altruism has all prevailed over empire, violence, and greed. So I'm going to show you the second act break reversal of Star Wars. It's one of the best second act break reversals of all time, I think, in the movies. It's the moment in which your hero has achieved a second act goal, but now he's inadvertently forcing the stakes of the global goal. Here it is. That's it! We did it! We did it! <laughs> Help! I think I'm melting! This is all your fault! <laughs> Are they away? They've just made the jump into hyperspace. You're sure the homing beacon is secure aboard their ship? I'm taking an awful risk, Vader. This had better work. 
So you get to page 75 and you escape from the Death Star, you know, you take R2-D2, you take the plans and you deliver it to the Rebel base, you know, and it seems as though you've achieved your second act goal. However, one page later, you got to reveal that the location of the Rebel base has inadvertently been revealed, you know, and that's this huge, huge setback in the external stakes of the story. And then one page later, Han Solo sort of flees and says, you know, I ain't sticking around here, and that's a huge setback in the philosophical stakes of the story. And then even a few pages before that, you had Obi-Wan killed, and that's the worst possible thing in terms of the internal stakes of the story. So for the third act of your story, you're going from page 75, the second act break, to page 90. And what ideally you want there is to have nothing going right for your hero. You just want one thing after another going wrong in all three sets of stakes, externally, internally, and philosophically. So in Star Wars, right, you have Obi-Wan gets killed, right? That's a huge setback emotionally in the internal stakes. You have the Death Star locate the Rebel base. That's a huge setback externally in the external stakes. And you have Han Solo abandon Luke, which is this big, big setback, your Judas moment of betrayal in the philosophical stakes of your story. And then you have the Rebel fighters take off, and they all get killed by Darth Vader. And then you have R2-D2 get shot by Darth Vader, and then you have the Death Star clearing the planet, and you have the Rebel base targeted, and then you have Peter Cushing saying, commence primary ignition. And then you have Darth Vader get onto Luke's tail, and he's chasing Luke, and he's chasing Luke, and he finally locks on Luke. And that's what I call the moment of despair, because we've just seen Darth Vader kill everybody else that he locked onto like that. We've just seen Darth Vader, you know, one by one pick off all of Luke's friends, all of Luke's allies. And now Darth Vader's chasing Luke, he locks onto him, and he says, I have you now. And that's an external failure, right? Because Luke is about to get killed and the rebel base is about to be destroyed. It's an internal failure, right? Because you're saying Uncle Owen was right. Like Luke is going to die just like his father did. He will have failed to achieve any kind of great destiny. But you also have a philosophical failure at this moment because at this moment, it feels like Han Solo was right. You know, he was smart to just leave the rebel base and take off and be self-interested and not try to help anybody else out. So it seems at this moment as though selfishness was smarter than altruism. Self-interest was smarter than loyalty. Tyranny is going to triumph over democracy. Greed is better than self-sacrifice, violence is going to triumph over cooperation. So you have a total failure. Luke has failed externally, he's failed internally, he's failed philosophically, and at this moment it seems like there's no positive outcome possible. Okay, and this is really, really important if you want to have a happy ending because you want your audience to feel as though your hero has earned their happy ending. They need to have gone to the end of their ability and still fallen short. And the more you can convince your audience that there's no way out, the more that you can convince your audience that everything is lost, the happier they're going to be when you're able to flip everything from failure to success and have a positive outcome. So how do you do that? How do you get from total failure to total success? It comes from the decisive act. So the decisive act in Star Wars is Han Solo returns and he shoots Darth Vader. And that's the thing that allows Luke to shoot his bullseye and blow up the Death Star. I have you not. And what's crucial here, again, is that your decisive act is an enactment of the underdog values of the story. You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. Here's where it all comes together at the end. You have your moment of despair. Darth Vader locks on Luke, says, I have you now. And then, ba-boom, Han Solo returns, shoots Darth Vader off Luke's tail. That's overturning the philosophical stakes of your story from negative to positive. And because that happens, Luke is able to shoot a bullseye. He blows up the Death Star. You're overturning the external stakes of your story from negative to positive. And because that happens, Obi-Wan comes back and says, remember, the Force will be with you always. And you're overturning the internal emotional stakes of the story from negative to positive. It happens in 42 seconds, and that is an insanely great ending. So let's go back and watch those last two minutes of Star Wars, and we'll just play them through, but you'll see how each of these moments play out from the kamikaze moment of commitment to the moment of despair and to the decisive act. So here it is, the two-minute climax of Star Wars. Use the Force, Luke. Let go, Luke. The Force is strong in this one. Luke, trust me. Switched off your targeting computer. What's wrong? Nothing. I'm all right. I lost our two. Rebel base in range. You may fire when ready. Command is primary ignition. I 
have you not? What? Look out! Okay, so the general point here is that for an insanely great ending, you don't have just one climax to your story, right? You have three climaxes, external, internal, and philosophical, and you want them all to be logically connected in as close proximity to each other as possible and also in ascending order of importance. Ideally, you want to go from total failure to total success in 45 seconds or less. And this is like the hardest thing in the world to do in terms of storytelling, but if you can convincingly pull it off, you got yourself an insanely great ending, okay? So now, The Graduate. There's three sets of stakes in The Graduate, external, internal, and philosophical. So what's externally at stake in The Graduate? It's not anything big like Star Wars. It's not the fate of the galaxy or anything like that. It's something very small, very intimate, very tied to the hero, Benjamin Braddock. And Mike Nichols sets it up in this early scene at the beginning of the movie. Hey, what's the matter? Guess we're all downstairs, Ben, waiting to see you. Dad, can you explain to them that I have to be alone for a while? These are all our good friends, Ben. Most of them have known you since, well, practically since you were born. What is it, Ben? I'm just... Worried? Well... About what? I guess about my future. What about it? I don't know. I want it to be... To be what? Different. So it's the future. That's what's at stake. Ben has a future, and he just wants it to be different. So what are the internal stakes of The Graduate? What is emotionally at stake in the story? Now, obviously, it's a love story. He meets Elaine Robinson. He falls in love. And there's this great scene in the middle of the movie where he talks to Elaine about how much he likes her. So uh, here is the scene that sets up what's emotionally at stake in The Graduate. Elaine, I like you. I like you so much. Do you believe that? Do you? Yes. You're the first... You're the first thing for so long that I've liked. The first person I could stand to be with. My whole life is such a waste. It's just nothing. So what's at stake here is Ben is falling in love with Elaine, but it's not just, you know, that she's pretty and they've had a good time going out, but that he feels connected to her. Like, she's the first person that he can stand to talk to, you know, the first person that he can stand to be around. And Ben has been a guy, like, this has been his quest for the whole movie is to try to find somebody that he can connect to, and now he's finally found it. He's finally found Elaine, and there's that connection made. So it's a love story, but it's also a story about finding someone that you can talk to and somebody who understands you. And this is the thing that Ben has been searching for the whole movie. So now we go to the philosophical stakes of The Graduate, and uh, it's a little murkier than Star Wars. It's not quite so black and white. It's not just like, you know, good guys and bad guys. You know, it's a little murkier. Um, but to figure it out, you know, you go back and you figure out who's the antagonist of your story and what's the antagonist Arya. Like, what's the moment in which your bad guy says to your hero, like, kid, here's the way the world works. 
So there's one person who comes along in the first five minutes of The Graduate and explicitly talks to Ben about what his future should be. So here's the speech I think a lot of people would consider the antagonist aria of The Graduate. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. Exactly how do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Enough said. That's a deal. So, plastics, right? There's a great future in it. But I would argue that this is actually not the antagonist aria of the story because it's only one word and it doesn't really speak to the underlying values that are embedded in the story. There's actually a scene a few minutes later on where someone sits down with Ben and tells him how he should be living his life. And I would say that's the real antagonist aria of The Graduate. So, just to set the scene, Mrs. Robinson has sort of asked Ben to drive her home. She's lured him into the house. She lures him upstairs into her bedroom, and then she comes in and drops all her clothes, and she says, Ben, I'm ready to have an affair with you. I'm available to you anytime. And oh my God, all of a sudden, Mr. Robinson pulls in, and Ben has to quickly run downstairs and sit down there and pretend like he was looking after her and, and trying to protect her and just waiting for Mr. Robinson to come home. And Mr. Robinson comes in, and he pours himself a drink, right? And he sits down, and he tells Ben how Ben should be living his life. So here, in all its glory, is the antagonist aria of The Graduate. Ben, I think, I think you ought to be taking it a little easier right now than you seem to be. Mm. So a few wild oats. Take things as they come. Have a good time with the girls and so forth. Don't get up. I, uh, I was just telling, uh, Ben, ben here that he ought to sow a few wild oats. Have a good time while he can. You think that's sound advice? Yes, I do. I've got to go. So there's a bad guy saying to your hero, like, go out, have fun with the girls, you know, don't take things too seriously. And you think to yourself, well, is that, maybe that's what's at stake philosophically, is that it's just like true love versus, you know, going out and having empty sex. Um, but there's more to it. Obviously, it's got to be a little bit more than that. So there's another scene later in the movie where Ben and Mrs. Robinson embark on this affair, and they're going out and they're sneaking and they're going to a hotel room and having sex all the time, and they never talk to each other. Like, Ben is trying to connect. He's trying to connect, and they never talk about anything. So finally, there's a scene in the movie in which he says, no, no, I want to talk. I want to have a conversation. And so this is a scene that also is a clue as to what the philosophical stakes of the story are. I don't know anything about how you work this. What do you say to him when you leave the house at night? Nothing. He's asleep. Always? Doesn't he wake up when you come home? We have separate bedrooms. Oh, I see. So you don't... I mean, I don't like to seem like I'm prying, but I guess you don't sleep together or anything. No, we don't. Well, how long has this been going on? For God's sake, let's well, drop wait a this. minute. Why did you marry him? See if you can guess. Well, I can't. Think real hard, Benjamin. I can't see why you did, unless you didn't have to marry him or anything, did you? Don't tell him, eh? So what we learn in this scene is that Mrs. Robinson didn't get married to Mr. Robinson because she loved him, right? She only got married to him because she got pregnant. And in the world at the time, single moms were frowned upon, and if you got pregnant, you were expected to get married to the man you got pregnant to. So you're saying philosophically, it seems as though what's at stake here is this question of do you live your life according to sort of true love or do you live your life according to social expectations? But it's not just like social expectations, right? There's also this sense of sort of jadedness and, and cynicism and sort of shallowness and like using other people. So you feel like, you know, maybe that's what's at stake is true love versus this horrible cynicism in the world. And now the problem for Ben is that he doesn't have a mentor. He doesn't have Obi-Wan. He doesn't have any sort of wise elder person who's going to come up and say like, kid, here's how you got to do it. And like, don't pay any attention to those other people. Here's a better way to live your life. So Ben's mentor, this is my argument, Ben's mentor is actually his feelings. His feelings are the thing that's sort of guiding him through life. Life, and it's going to come up into conflict with the dominant values of this world. So the contest philosophically in this story is between Ben and his feelings versus this whole dominant world and this whole universe of sort of cynicism and jadedness and shallowness and just people using other people. But it all kind of comes together in this beautiful scene that they stage in the middle of the movie in which Ben picks up Elaine, they go out on a date, and what's great about it is on the first date, Ben in, is enacting 
all those bad values in the universe. He's enacting the dominant values. He's being this sort of cynical, jaded, sleazy guy, and he takes her to the strip club, and it's just awful, you know? And he's trying to live his life according to the dominant values of that universe. And then finally, he looks up, he sees her crying, he feels terrible about it, and they go out and they have hamburgers. And then they have this conversation, and this is such a lesson for screenwriters, which is if your hero is going to talk to his love interest and they're going to bond, you really only get one scene, and you have to get it exactly right. It has to be a bullseye. So here is the scene in which Ben and Elaine have gone out, they've gotten hamburgers, they're sitting in their car, and they connect with each other, not just emotionally, but they connect with each other sort of philosophically. So here's a scene which is laying out what's philosophically at stake in The Graduate. I've had this feeling ever since I've graduated, this kind of compulsion that I have to be rude all the time, you know what I mean? Yes, I do. It's like I've been playing some kind of game, but the rules don't make any sense to me. They're being made up by all the wrong people. No. I mean, no one makes them up. They seem to have made themselves up. So this is what I think is philosophically at stake in The Graduate, is this question of how do you live your life? Do you live your life according to everyone's expectations, according to sort of the rules of social conformity, or do you trust your feelings? Do you, do you live your life according to what's inside you, what your feelings are? And what's interesting about that is that rules are the provenance of the community. We all have rules so that we can all get along within the community, and feelings are all about the individual. So in a weird way, The Graduate is the opposite of Star Wars in terms of its value. The Graduate is saying your individual feelings are more important than the rules of the community. Your individual feelings are more important than sort of the stifling conformity of the San Fernando Valley back in the 60s. Okay, so you have three sets of stakes in The Graduate. Externally, it's what's going to happen in Ben's future and will it be different. Internally, it's a sense of love with uh, Elaine Robinson, but it's mostly about this sense of connection. He's finally found someone to connect with, and can he sustain that connection? And then philosophically, it's this question of, do you live your life according to rules and expectations, or do you live your life according to your own feelings? Here's the page count for The Graduate, if it were, hypothetically, a 100-page screenplay. If you begin at the beginning, you meet... Benjamin Braddock, he's sort of lost, he's alienated, he's floating around in his pool. He, he doesn't like his parents, he doesn't want to be them, but he doesn't know sort of how to make his future different. And then, ba-boom, your inciting incident is Mrs. Robinson like drops her clothes and propositions him and says, I'm available to you anytime I want to have an affair. You know, and then like Hamlet, Ben sort of dithers and dithers, he doesn't know what to do. You know, and then finally, after the scuba diving scene, he's like, I can't take it anymore. I can't take the isolation anymore. I got to connect. I got to try and connect with someone. So he begins his affair with Mrs. Robinson. You kind of know it's not the thing that he should be doing, but he calls her up. They go to a hotel room and he begins the affair. And now, just like Star Wars, Benjamin has a goal in the second act, but it's not an external goal. It's not anything he's trying to achieve in the outside world. Ben is pursuing an internal goal. He's trying to connect with somebody. And then what happens is, and this is brilliant, of course, is that as soon as your hero embarks on their second act quest, you want to have a wrench come in and, like, you know, blow their plans apart. So in Star Wars, you know, Alderaan gets blown up. In The Graduate, you have Mrs. Robinson says to Bane, you cannot date Elaine. I have a daughter but you're not allowed to date her, and Ben goes, fine, I won't date her. So on page 50, he has to go on this date with Elaine, and he's trying to act like a jerk and sort of keep her at arm's length, and he can't do it, and at the end of the night, they've connected with each other. So your hero got what he wanted, right? He connected with somebody, but it just wasn't in the way that he expected. So as soon as Ben has connected with Elaine, right, you have to throw a new complication into your story. So Mrs. Robinson figures out, oh my God, like Ben is falling in love with Elaine, and she goes to Elaine and she lies. She says that Ben raped her. And she disconnects Ben from Elaine. You know, she sort of takes Elaine away from Ben and sends her off to Berkeley. So the rest of the second act is Ben going up to Berkeley, sort of pursuing Elaine Robinson, sort of following her around, wooing her, wooing her. And he finally finds out that, you know, Mrs. Robinson told all these lies to Elaine. And he says, no, 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 that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And he's gradually wearing down her defenses. And you get to the end of the second act and you get to the first kiss moment and boom, you've got it. Like Ben has connected with Elaine. So you get to the end of the second act, and Ben has actually achieved his goal. He's been able to connect with somebody who understands him, who gets him, and he doesn't quite feel so alone in the universe. Your hero has achieved his second act goal of connecting with somebody. And then, of course, you have to turn it all over because it's the end of the second act, and Mr. Robinson shows up, and he takes Elaine away from Ben. And then the climax of the story, of course, is Ben going, Elaine, 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 and then you have your happy ending. Okay, so here's the second act big reversal of The Graduate, and again, it's the moment in which your hero has finally achieved his second act goal, which in Ben's case is just to connect with another human being. And then one page later, suddenly a trapdoor opens underneath your hero and he falls into this all or nothing, do or die situation. So here it is, the second act break reversal of The Graduate. Good night. We're getting married.
marry tomorrow? No. The day after tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe we are, and maybe we're not. So there's a lot going on in this moment, right? Because you've gotten to the end of the second act. Ben has sort of wooed Elaine. She came back. She gave him this perfect kiss. He went out to buy the ring. You think everything's going great. But there's a bunch of huge setbacks happening all at the same time. Before the scene happened, there was an enormous like, emotional setback, internal setback, because Ben has found out that Elaine is actually engaged to you know, marry Carl, the makeup king of the fraternity. One page later, after the kiss, Mr. Robinson shows up the very next scene and takes Elaine away from Ben and says, that's it. You're never going to see her again. We're hiding her. You're never going to get a chance to connect to this person that, that you thought you had this, such a strong connection with. And so Ben, you know, the next scene of the movie is he runs over to the sorority where Elaine is and he's trying to find her again, you know, and she's already gone, but she's left behind a letter. And this is a huge philosophical setback in the story. And this is what I call the Judas moment of betrayal because Elaine says to Ben, I love you, but it would never work. And again, it's now your hero's closest ally. Elaine Robinson is telling Ben, I love you. You know, my feelings are that I love you, but it would never work because of the circumstances. We have to follow social rules instead of following our feelings. So again, this is a huge philosophical setback. Here's the scene. Her roommate's coming down with a note for you. Dear Benjamin, please forgive me, because I know what I'm doing is the best thing for you. My father is so upset, you've got to understand. I love you, but it would never work out. So now you're at the end of the second act, and you're heading to the third act, and Ben, the hero, has just had these huge setbacks in all three sets of stakes. And now you're heading towards the climax of your story. And again, what you want to have happen is you never want anything going right for your hero between page 75 and page 90. You just want one setback after another. So in The Graduate, the first thing Ben does is he confronts Mrs. Robinson, and she says, well, the wedding is already planned. Eleni is getting married, and we won't tell you where it is. Sorry we won't be able to invite you to the wedding, Benjamin, but the arrangements have been so rushed. So, you know, he finally learns where the wedding is. He drives like crazy to Santa Barbara. He runs out of gas. He runs like crazy down to the church. He gets to the church. The doors are locked. You know, he doesn't know what to do. And he runs up those stairs and he comes up to the, to the mezzanine. He looks down and he sees Elaine kiss Carl. And you go, oh, my God, they're married. It's too late. And that's your moment of despair. So Ben has failed externally, right? Because Elaine has married Carl and he's now facing this empty future. But he's also failed internally, which is his love that he has for Elaine. It's not being reciprocated anymore. And it seems as though that connection, that bond that he felt with, uh, with Elaine has been lost. But he's also, this is important, he's also failed philosophically because now it seems as though rules have triumphed over feelings, that jadedness and cynicism have triumphed over love, that conformity is triumphing over nonconformity. And basically the whole big bad world has triumphed over Benjamin Braddock. And ideally what you want is if you stop the movie at this moment and you just ask people in the audience who've never seen it before, you go like, well, how is Ben going to get out of this? Again, the best thing that you want is for audiences to go, I don't know, that's it. It's over. He's screwed. There's no way Ben is going to get what he wants. You know, you have to have your moment of despair seem like it's absolute done deal. There's no positive outcome possible. And then you have your decisive act. And I'm just going to play the last two minutes of The Graduate and you can see how it all unfolds. And then I'll go back and I'll break it down as to what's happening in every moment. But here it is. And if you haven't seen the movie before, if you've never seen The Graduate, my God, stop watching this lecture right now. Turn it off. Go watch The Graduate and then come back. And now that you've come back, you've seen The Graduate. Here is the two minute climax of The Graduate.
Who is that guy? What's he doing? Take care of him, please. Do it. Eli! Get him, buddy. Get him. Stop. Okay, so there it is. It's like one of the greatest endings of all time. And uh, if you break it down, under the hood, it works in a lot of the same ways that the climax of Star Wars works. So you get to your moment of despair, right? Ben is there at the window. He's looking down, and Lane is married Car- Carl, and you go, oh, my God, it seems like there's no good outcome possible. And then you have, again, the kamikaze moment of commitment, which is your mentor's voice coming back and speaking you know, inside the head of the hero and going, like, remember, remember, remember what we talked about in the first act? So, of course, Ben's mentor is his feelings. You see him struggling in this moment where he's looking down and he's struggling, like, do I follow the rules? I mean, this is a moment of maximum social conformity. Do I follow the rules and just not say anything, or do I let my feelings out? And so his kamikaze moment of commitment is that he decides he's going to follow his feelings. He's not going to follow the rules. He's not going to follow anyone's expectations. He's just going to trust his feelings, just like Luke does. He's going to trust his feelings, and he raises his hands up, and he starts pounding on the window, right? And he starts calling out, Elaine, Elaine, Elaine. And it's such a great kamikaze moment of commitment because the first time you see this movie, right, you go, oh, my God, what are you doing? You're making everything worse, you know? Like, you just feel like, oh, you're digging your hole deeper. You're fooling the audience into thinking that your hero is doing the wrong thing. But because he did that, right, because he listened to his feelings, that's the thing that turns Elaine around. And then you have Mrs. Robinson restate the dominant values of the universe by saying, I care of him. He's too late. He's too late, right? Which means that rules are going to triumph over feelings, that conformity is going to triumph over true love. And at that moment, you just want to go, well, that's it. According to the rules of this world, even if he's up there banging on the window, it's too late. Like, Elaine has already gotten married. And then the decisive act is sort of the Han Solo moment. Like, Elaine comes in and she just yells out. (coughs) And that's the moment in which she flips over, right? She is going to live her life according to her feelings, right? And not according to everyone's expectations. So the moment that Elaine says, Ben, right, you're overturning the internal stakes of the story, the emotional stakes of the story, because you're saying, oh my God, that connection that they had, that bond they felt, it's still there. It's still powerful. Like they're willing to like make fools of themselves in public because they feel that strongly. And then because she calls out Ben, you know, you have Mrs. Robinson go over there and say to her, Okay, it's too late, not for me. It's too late. And Elaine says, not for me. And that's overturning the philosophical stakes of the story. Because what Elaine is saying to Mrs. Robinson at this moment is like, you live your life according to everyone's expectations. And that's how you chose to live your life, but not for me. Like, even if I married Carl, even if we're in the church and everybody's standing there watching us, like, I am not going to let everyone's expectations dictate my life. I'm going to listen to my feelings, and that's going to be my guide to life. And now, because you've overturned the philosophical stakes of your story, Ben and Elaine, you know, fight and push and shove and go through the glass doors and they get away, and you're overturning the external stakes of your story. So Elaine says, Ben, you're overturning the internal stakes of your story. It's too late, not for me. You're overturning the philosophical stakes of your story. And then Ben and Elaine escape. You're overturning the external stakes of your story. It happens in 42 seconds, and that is an insanely great ending. So now we get to Little Miss Sunshine, which is embarrassing because that script is just nowhere near as great as Star Wars or The Graduate, but at least it shows how I was able to take lessons from those uh, scripts and apply them to a screenplay of my own. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to add one last disclaimer because, again, I just know I'm going to get roasted alive by people 
who are going to say that I'm trying to turn storytelling into a paint-by-numbers exercise, which is not what I'm trying to do. Like, all these storytelling ideas don't apply to the most important part of storytelling, which is just coming up with a great idea and with great characters and getting a first draft down on paper. So you can't use these story ideas to plot forward, okay? They only work in retrospect when you've already had that great moment of inspiration, you've laid down that first draft, and now you're just trying to find a way to turn it into the best version of itself, okay? It's like when all else fails, you read the directions, right? So end of disclaimer, let's look at Little Miss Sunshine. The stakes of Little Miss Sunshine are pretty easy to figure out. They're all set up in this following scene. There's no sense in entering a contest if you don't think you're going to win. So, do you think you can win Little Miss Sunshine? Richard. Are you going to win? Yes. We're going to California. <laughs> so there it is. It's pretty simple. What's externally at stake in Little Miss Sunshine is whether Olive Hoover is going to win the Little Miss Sunshine contest. When I was writing the script, I thought, you know, what I was going to try to do was to have the smallest possible set of external stakes, but then have the emotional stakes and especially the philosophical stakes be as big as possible. So it was a deliberate choice on my part for a comedy to have the external stakes be as small as possible. Now, in terms of the internal emotional stakes, it's also pretty simple. Here's the scene in which we're establishing in the first act what's emotionally at stake in Little Miss Sunshine. You know, actually, there is a message from Cindy on the machine. Something about Little Mrs. Sunshine. Sunshine. What? Little Miss Sunshine? Yeah. What? Cheryl, it's Cindy. Remember when Olive was here last month? She was runner-up in the regional Little Miss Sunshine. Well, they just called right now and said, had to forfeit her crown. I don't know why something about diet pills, but anyway, now she has a place in the state contest in Redondo Beach. <laughs> So I, I didn't even realize, like, what a crucial scene that was until after I wrote the script. And even after I sort of saw the movie, I realized, like, just, like, that moment of Olive, like, getting the news and reacting in such a, such a like, euphoric way, right, in such an emotional way, that was the thing that allowed people to jump on board with the movie. So you're establishing right at the beginning what's emotionally at stake in this movie is Olive's hopes and dreams. She wants to become a beauty queen. But it's not just about hopes and dreams, right? Because what you want is sort of in the middle of your story, you always try to sort of deepen the stakes of your story, reveal something that, that your audience hadn't suspected. So there's a scene in the middle of the movie that adds to the emotional stakes of the movie. Uh, so here it is. It's Olive and Grandpa in the motel room setting up the internal emotional stakes of the story. Grandpa? Yeah. Am I pretty? Olive? You are the most beautiful girl in the whole world. <laughs> You're just saying that? No, I'm not. I'm madly in love with you. And it's not because of your brains or your personality. It's because you're beautiful, inside and out. Grandpa? What? I don't want to be a loser. You're not a loser. Where'd you get the idea you're a loser? Because... Dad hates losers. So suddenly you're revealing that it's not just about sort of Olive achieving her hopes and dreams. It's also the story of this little girl who's trying to connect to her dad. You know, she, she's reaching out to her dad and she feels like the only way that she can do it is to be a winner because Richard is obsessed with winning. So now what you're putting at stake is not just like, is she going to achieve her hopes and dreams, but it's also her fear of failure and her fear of letting her father down. And so it's that bond between the child and the parent, that bond between Richard and, and Olive that's now being threatened and put at stake. And now we get to the philosophical stakes of the story. Once again, you just have your bad guy show up, give his antagonist Arya, and he's saying to the audience and to, to the characters, like, this is the way the world works. So here is the antagonist Arya for Little Miss Sunshine. There are two kinds of people in this world, winners and losers. Inside each and every one of you, at the very core of your being, is a winner waiting to be awakened and unleashed upon the world. So it's Richard, right? Richard is the philosophical antagonist of Little Miss Sunshine because he's sort of the, the embodiment, the apotheosis of the dominant values of this universe, he sees the whole world in terms of sort of winners versus losers. And his whole 
way of looking at the world is based on sort of status and rank and hierarchy and basically the approval of others. Like you're trying to be a winner and you're trying to at all costs avoid being a loser. And what's important is that these are the dominant values of this whole universe. It's not just Richard. Richard's is the most sort of like virulent embodiment of these values. But everybody else in this, in this universe kind of shares the same sort of like, I want to be number one. I want to be a winner kind of values. So you have Richard. You know, he's a motivational speaker. He wants to be a success. He wants to be a winner. But you also have sort of, you know, Frank, who's sort of the highbrow version of Richard. He wants to be the number one Proust scholar in the U.S. Larry Sugarman is perhaps the second most highly regarded proof scholar in the U.S. Who's number one? That would be me, Rich. What? And you also have Dwayne, who wants to be a fighter pilot, like who has this idea of just sort of, you know, joining the Navy and sort of like transcending his whole family. And I would call these sort of like the values of public life, you know, the values of sort of um, the marketplace where you're trying to, you know, sort of impress other people, you know, and avoid being seen as a loser. And so just as you have an antagonist in the philosophical realm, in Little Miss Sunshine, you also have a mentor. You sort of have an Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he's the guy who's going to sit down with your, with your hero and go, like, don't listen to all those other people. Like, here are the real values that are important in life. So here is the philosophical mentor of Little Miss Sunshine. I don't want to be a loser. You're not a loser. Where'd you get the idea you're a loser? Because Dad hates losers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up a minute. You know what a loser is? A real loser is somebody that's so afraid of not winning, they don't even try. Now, you're trying, right? Yeah. Well, then you're not a loser. We're going to have fun tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah. We can tell them all to go to hell. Good night, sweetie. I love you. So it's Grandpa, right? Grandpa is the Obi-Wan Kenobi of this movie. He's the mentor for all of it. He's the one who says, like, you know, we're going to have fun tomorrow. Like, we can tell them all to go to hell. Like, it doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter if we win or lose. And so Grandpa, you know, it, it, for him, life is not about winning the approval of others. It's just about having fun, having pleasure, sort of freedom and autonomy. It's about letting yourself be defined by yourself and not being defined by others. And I would call those sort of the values of private life. You know, it's sort of the, the values of friendship, the values of romance, the values of creativity, the values of the spirit. Like, the things that other people can't see, you know, those are the values that, 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 that the grandpa sort of is all about. So you're setting up this universe in which sort of the dominant values of the universe, you know, are the values of the public self. You know, you live for others, you live for status. The underdog values of this universe are sort of the values of private life, you know, that you're going to just, you know, live for yourself. You don't care what anyone else thinks. And this is kind of the reason why I wrote the whole movie, which is, if you'll allow me to get up on my soapbox for a second... I feel like we all live kind of two lives. We sort of have two selves. We have our public self, which is all about sort of like wealth and position and status. It's all the stuff that's visible. It's all the stuff that everybody else can see and judge you on. But we also have private lives. We also have stuff that's hidden from the rest of the world. It's visible only to a few people, like only to a few loved ones. And that's, you know, your private life. And I just feel like we're at a point where the values of public life, sort of the values of the marketplace, the values of judging people as to being winners and losers is starting to seep into the realm of private life and especially into the realm of childhood. And I just think that's terrible. I think that children need to be protected from those values, that childhood should just be about childhood. And um, what's important about these two sets of values is the public values of wealth, position, status, fame, success, you know, just being an adult, those are things that are not in your control. And the stuff in private life, love, friendship, creativity, those are things that are within your control. And as the Stoics say, if your happiness is dependent on things you can't control, you're never going to be happy. So Little Miss Sunshine was written to sort of stick up for the values of private life. Okay, so lecture over. I'm getting off my soapbox. So uh, Little Miss Sunshine, the page count, uh, we start even before the movie begins. We've established that Frank has failed. He's had this sort of failed love affair. You start on page one, you meet Olive, and she's practicing to be in a beauty pageant, but nothing's happening yet. Your inciting incident, bolt from the blue, changes your hero's life, changes their sense of the future. Aunt Cindy calls, says you've got a place in a Little Miss Sunshine pageant, right? So like Hamlet, the, the family sort of dithers and dithers and is trying to figure out what they're going to do and what they realize is they've all got to go to Redondo Beach. So your first act break, they set off, they all get in the VW bus, they take off, they're driving to Redondo Beach. So you get into your second act and of course things start going wrong. You know, sort of on page 37, Richard's book deal falls through. On page 50, at the midpoint, Grandpa dies. You get to page 62 and Dwayne like realizes he's colorblind, realizes he's never going to be a pilot, realizes his dream is all over. And a boom, 
page 75, you get to the end of the second act and they arrive at Redondo Beach. So you arrive at Redondo Beach and your heroes have achieved their second act goal, right? But now you're forcing the stakes of your global goal because Olive is now either going to win the Little Miss Sunshine pageant, like she promised Richard, or she's going to lose the pageant, but there's no going back. It's all or nothing, do or die, kill or be killed. And then you have your Judas moment of betrayal, right? You have the person who's closest to your hero go and stab them in the back philosophically, and that's Dwayne. Dwayne is Olive's closest ally. He's the person who's sort of the closest with her, and he looks around and he sees what's going on. He says, this place is fucked. And he goes back and he talks to Cheryl and he says, like, I don't want her to go on, Mom. Like, she's not a beauty queen. And Olive overhears this. Hey, how are you feeling? Better. Where's Olive? Here, what's up? Mom, I don't want Olive doing this. Oh, my God. Look around. Oh God. Oh, this place is fucked. Right. Look, I don't want these people judging all of Fuck them. Listen, it is too late. No, it's not too late. You're the mom, and you're supposed to protect her. Everyone is going to laugh at her, mom. Please don't let her do this. Olive Hoover, two minutes. Look, she's not a beauty queen. She's just not. And so when Dwayne goes backstage, right, he's seeing the world through Richard's eyes. He's saying, in this life, there's winners and losers, and Olive is not going to win, so I don't even want her to go on. So the third act, you want nothing but setbacks happening. So, you know, with Little Miss Sunshine, there's, there's setbacks happening all the way through the movie. So Frank has failed. You know, Larry Sugarman gets the guy. Richard fails. Stan Grossman rebuffs him. You know, Grandpa dies. Your philosophical mentor is gone. Dwayne fails. They arrive in Redondo Beach. Then you get to the swimsuit show, and you're just establishing visually that Olive is just kind of out of her league, and she doesn't fit in with everybody else. And then you get to the talent competition, and you show, like, oh, my God, all the other girls have these great, crazy kind of routines. And then you have Richard go backstage, and he says, like, I don't want her to go on. And you have Dwayne go backstage and say, she's not a beauty queen mom. And you get to your kamikaze moment of commitment where Cheryl sits down with Olive, right? And she says for Olive, like, we've come all this way. Like, we're proud of you. But you don't have to do this if you don't want to. So it's up to you. Like, you can either go on and dance or you can sit this one out. It's all up to you. And this is your kamikaze moment of commitment, right? Because this is the moment where your hero is sitting there and they have to make a choice. They have to decide what they're going to do. And there's two sets of values. And Olive at this point has heard there's no way she's going to win. And if she were living her life according to Richard's values, there's no sense in any consciousness we can't win she wouldn't go on. But there's something else. Like, she's got the voice of her mentor. She's got grandpa, right, who comes back and says, like, we'll tell them all to go to hell. We're going to have fun tomorrow. So listening to the voice of the mentor, again, Olive stands up, and she walks down, and she's going to go on. And again, what you want in a good sort of kamikaze moment of commitment, you want your audience going, no, 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 don't do it. Like, you want your audience freaking out and going, like, stop, stop, don't do that. So then Olive walks out on stage, and she's just, like, standing there, right? She's got a funny costume on, and at this moment, you want it to seem like Olive is doomed, like she's going to lose and be humiliated, and it's just going to be, like, the worst thing ever, and there's no positive outcome possible. So let's just play the climactic two minutes, and then we'll go back and we'll see how it works under the hood. So here it is, the two-minute climax of Little Miss Sunshine. Um, I'd like to dedicate this to my grandpa, who showed me these moves. Oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> is he here? Where's your grandpa right now? In the trunk of our car. Okay. Well, take it away, Olive.
Okay, so here's how it breaks down. Olive walks out on stage, and you get the joke about the trunk of the car, and then the MC leaves, and Olive is left alone on stage. And this is your moment of total failure, right? Because it seems like Olive is doomed. Like, she's doomed to external failure. She's not going to win a Little Miss Sunshine contest. And then there's an internal failure, too, because not only is Olive going to sort of, like, lose the contest and be humiliated, but she's also going to sort of hurt that relationship with her dad. And there's just going to be this overall, like, sense of family shame amongst the Hoover family because they're all such a horrible bunch of losers. And now you also have a philosophical failure, right? Because you're saying winning is more important than fun. Public image is more important than your private self. Competition is more important than just pleasure. And then you have your decisive act. So the music starts, and all starts dancing, and the decisive act is she tears her pants off, which means she's going to fail externally, right, because she's not going to win the Little Miss Sunshine contest. But at the very same instant, she's succeeding philosophically because she's enacting and affirming the values that Grandpa taught her back in the motel, right? We're going to have fun tomorrow, and we're going to tell them all to go to hell. And the last set of stakes is emotional, right? Because you still have that relationship between Olive and Richard at stake. And at first, Richard's uncomfortable, right? He's embarrassed. But as he watches the audience heckle Olive, and then they get up and they start to walk out, Richard converts to the underdog values of the story, and he stands up and he starts supporting Olive. So Olive tears her pants off. She fails to overturn the external stakes of the story. But at the very same instant, she's affirming Grandpa's values, and that's overturning the philosophical stakes of the story. And then Richard stands up and starts supporting Olive, and that's overturning the emotional stakes of the story. It happens in 45 seconds, and that, I hope, is an insanely great ending. Okay, so in summary, your insanely great ending is you have your second act break reversal, you've solved your second act goal, but you're creating a crisis in your global goal. You have an act three drive, one setback after another, down to a moment of despair. You have your kamikaze moment of commitment in which your hero is acting on the mentor's values. You have this moment of despair in which it seems as though you've been defeated internally, externally, and philosophically, and there's no positive outcome possible. And then you have your decisive act that turns everything around. And what's crucial here, the most important thing is that your decisive act is meaningful in that it's an enactment of the underdog values of the story. And because your hero trusts the mentor, because he trusts the underdog values of the story, that allows for a rabid reversal of stakes in the story, and you're overturning the moral order of the universe that you've created. And what's interesting about these movies is that all the heroes, Luke, Ben, and Olive, are all innocent heroes, which means they're not flawed. So the conflict in this story comes from the universe that they exist in. They live in a flawed universe. They are not flawed characters in a flawed universe, which means that Luke, Ben, and Olive are all the redeemers of that universe. So, in a nutshell, you create a flawed universe, you overturn the moral order of that universe from negative to positive in 45 seconds or less, and that is an insanely great ending. So that's pretty much everything I know about how to write a story with an insanely great ending. And remember, I'm not saying that this is the only way to tell a story, okay? A story can be anything. Like, you can write a story any way you want. I'm just hoping that if you love movies and you're just starting out trying to write your own screenplay, maybe some of these ideas will be helpful. So good luck and happy writing.